Okay, with no further ado, I want to introduce a good friend and uh, one of my heroes, Victor Lee Lewis. Victor is the founder and director of a very powerful initiative called the Radical Resilience Institute. And uh, there's too many, too many words to say here. Victor is a, a theologian, a teacher, a writer, a social justice advocate, a pioneer. Um, Victor is well known for the leadership role he played in a very powerful documentary about racism called The Color of Fear. And uh, Victor was also instrumental in pulling together a curriculum for that, uh, that documentary that's used in classrooms and in training programs. Victor's a powerful trainer himself, um, working, yeah, just across a broad spectrum uh, from spirituality to healing to racial justice to you name it, if it has to do with making the world a better place and to help those of us who are aspiring to be better human beings to do so. Uh, Victor's put thought into it. And I guess on a more personal note, I just wanna share that in, in my experience, Victor is a truth teller. And I've experienced you, Victor, as a person who tells the truth with clarity, with conviction, but also your prof your prophetic voice is a loving voice and that, that has made a deep impact on me as i've learned from you and as i've developed a friendship with you so it's my pleasure to turn it over to Victor Lee lewis and thanks so much for being with us victor well it's a real um deep honor and blessing for this um, black body in the body of the world to be able to address you in uh, what I believe may be the most exciting time to be alive in the history of our species. I do believe that we are, um, wrestling with the opening question in uh, what Buckminster Fuller calls our, our species final exam. And I'll come back to that in a moment. It's my general temperament to speak really fast and intensely, uh, to speak a sort of stream of consciousness and to jump horses sometimes in the middle of a paragraph, occasionally in the middle of a sentence, you may witness that. But I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm a um, um, somewhat um, atypically minded person. Um, I identify as being on the neurodivergence spectrum, certainly seriously hardcore ADHD. I am tapping my brake so intensely right now even though I'm hopping up and down excited. And based on um, clues and breadcrumbs, I have uh, a, an intense suspicion that I'm also on the uh, autism spectrum. I have uh, strange gullibility and capacity to make a social faux pas that shocks even my closest friends and comrades. Before uh, getting um, to the program, the question, I want to make a land acknowledgement. Um, broadcasting in Berkeley from <clears throat> traditional uh, Ohlone lands in the, uh, of the Karkin and Chechenya bands, uh, probably like a good many or most of us. It's changed my world to do land acknowledgements at every public gathering that I'm a part of, because suddenly I realized that um, every 
chunk of land that I inhabit has a story. It's like the body of the East Bay has its own layered story, meta story, story of many stories. And one of them is about the, the sovereign stewards of um, the place where we are and uh, what we know about them, what we don't know about them and why. I'd like to bring that into all my meetings now. And what it's done for me is, uh, as long as I'm within the property uh, and social contract um, paradigm a little bit, I feel like paying rent every time I acknowledge I'm on a lonely land. And I have. I'll, I'll be paying rent um, from whatever uh, uh, gifts um, uh, devolve to me from today because um, I think, but in, in my heart, it's a, it's a, it's a gift, but I also uh, feel like it is uh, uh, a kind of duty, but not uh, externally imposed, one related to my um, hood hippie monastic uh, calling. I've called myself a social justice educator, social justice activist, um, um, feral theologian, and now I would say maybe chaplain at large, a chaplain being a, um, a spiritual uh, companion or a spiritual friend in uh, two organisms, bodies, large and small, single person, a uh, single whole person or a single whole community or single whole planet. And um, because I don't have a, um, a congregation that I'm full time at, um, a proud member of uh, First Congregational Church of Oakland, but don't spend much time there. Um, yeah, chaplain at large suits me fine. And among other things, it, it means we talk about things that are important um, and we and we show up with our full aliveness behind um, whatever our message and will to connect uh, is. And my will to connect with you today concerns what I believe is this uh, pivot point uh, that we find ourselves in: the coronavirus pandemic. Pandemic. The um, coronavirus or compassion virus, as I've uh, spoken of it in my imagination, is a, I believe, a profound uh, evolutionary invitation to the entire human species. It's done something that has been uh, very difficult for ideology to achieve. One, it has uh, demonstrated uh, through evidence that uh, the human species is entirely and irreducibly interdependent. We have a, a 180 so-called sovereign nations. 180 sovereign nations have uh, coronavirus infections. Another thing that the coronavirus has done, and I believe this is so, so interesting, is it has shown a forensic light into every institution, every stratified system that is kind of overlaid upon our fundamental interdependence through um, violence and coercion and domination within uh, 5,000 years of, of empire systems. New and um, more complex and reinvented forms of uh, patriarchy. I'm a, I'm a kind of radical feminist. I believe we've been doing empire for about 5,000 years and that uh, the control of the earth is associated with the control of uh, 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 creatures and the 
preacher that man has set himself to control uh, first and foremost is uh, uh, the, the female human, perhaps the first um, uh, domesticated humans were um, um, family members of, and uh, reproductive partners of, uh, of men. And I, I believe that uh, with Martin Luther King and uh, people before him and people of many traditions that uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere that we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality that we're tied in a single garment of destiny, sure. And the, the thing that uh, has obsessed me, I would say from, at, uh, for the last 50 years at least, is the um, the interposing, interlapping, overlapping dynamics of whole systems, be that um, a universe system, a galactic system, a solar system, a planetary system, a, a Gaian biological system, a social system, um, systems of ideas. And I've been caught up with the intersection of all those things and um, fervently so. So I wanna do a little bit of uh, confession of my personal quirks. Like I'm, I'm a bit of a mad scientist. I have a secret lab or layer where things happen that I hardly ever talk about. And I've been like that since I was probably 13 years old and discovered the card catalog at my junior high school, 14. And, um, and I realized that the card catalog was like a holographic microcosm of every book that was in the library. And I thought, I want to know everything, so I'm going to read that. So I read all the abstracts on all the index cards and all the uh, drawers in the card catalog in my junior high school library and loved it. Um, I put it in a uh, sort of a interdisciplinary context because I'd read the World Book Encyclopedia in um, sixth grade because I, I wanted to understand the world. And that was my literal motivation. I saw this book that was called The World Book. And I'm like, the world is so confusing to me. Look at that great big book with all those volumes there. I guess that's the go-to book if you want to understand the world. And I did. So I went in on it. And, uh, and it gave me a, a dramatically interdisciplinary um, approach to knowledge because the articles in, uh, uh, in the world book could be in humanities or religion or history or biology or chemistry or, you know, and all kinds of color plates and charts and things. And all of this um, rested comfortably between uh, each of, of, of the uh, bindings of, uh, of all the volumes. And so it never ever occurred to me until I got to college that uh, knowledge was supposed to be, according to somebody somewhere, uh, in silos and specialties and specializations. I've always been a radically interdisciplinary uh, thinker. And so after I graduated from the, the, the junior uh, high school uh, library card catalog, I went to the branch library card catalog and then the uh, um, city branch car catalog. This is like a, an obsession for me, or um, I think what they call a, 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 um, a hyper-focus issue for um, um, uh, people on the spectrum. And that's, this is one of the big clues for that, by the way, that I wanted to have the microcosm uh, or the abstract of every book that existed in the library in my head so that I would know at any given time where to look or what to look for in order to, to learn something. And 
uh, my core interest was the actually the intersection and harmony of all knowledge altogether. So uh, natural science, social science, humanities, uh, uh, history, you know, any of the disciplines, um, hard or soft, I, I, I wanted to know it all and how it um, related. And why, why am I taking all this time about myself? Because I uh, have always uh, wanted to shake that tree of knowledge for two sources. One is an understanding of personal suffering and the meaning of life and the meaning of suffering, but also to understand the meaning of healing and mending and social justice. You know, I was, again, a naive, literal-minded thinker. And since there was a magnificent library in my neighborhood, I assumed as a teenager that I lived in a society that privileged and prized knowledge, and it broke my heart uh, years later to realize, man, people really don't give a, give a crap. They might give a crap about uh, getting some training or uh, in a discipline so that they can um, master a career and make some money or something. Some people, a lot of people also also are committed to making a contribution. But I had an idle pursuit in which I stuffed, I don't know, but 50 to 100,000 book abstracts into my head by the time I was 20 years old. And so uh, I've been a little bit disdainful of academia uh, since I, I know how to do all my own research and, um, and cross-reference things. And my um, life um, pursuit was uh, transformed when I met the work of uh, Buckminster Fuller, who always started with the big picture of the universe and, uh, and proposed for the first time that I'd ever heard that the world could work for everybody in a better way than in, that it's worked for anybody so far if we would collaborate and um, and then he said that all of the human-made systems that we've set in motion until now are on the edge of collapse and that the planetary ecology due to the fossil fuel economy and the extraction and profit system is also reaching a terminal point. And he said this, and uh, he started saying it in, 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 the, in the 70s, at least, and with the um, um, operating manual for a spaceship Earth, which um, I was exposed to for the first time when I was 16. So I've been chewing on those ideas for like 45 years. And, um, and he predicted that the economic system would collapse, that our system of liberal democracy would collapse, that, um, that our public health system um, uh, uh, or collapse because it wasn't designed around meeting uh, human needs, and that um, the knowledge system uh, the, uh, would collapse because, again, it was not devoted to uh, the university system wasn't devoted to or initiating to us, initiating us into the universe and helping us to cope within it in a um, profound and viable way. Um, uh, so ever since he made that case, I was convinced that this thing was going to happen. And probably within two days after the um, Bay Area wide shelter in place order, I thought, oh my God, it's actually happening. This thing is beginning to fall down right now. And I went out and bought um, many yards of um, N95 analog filter fabric and uh, found 13 gallons of 99% alcohol and all sorts of things that preppers and um, doomsday, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, doomsday preppers would uh, find themselves doing. And I was surprised that I had the I had this like handwriting on the wall um, prescience so that I was able to um, avoid 
a lot of the supply chain pressures. And I do believe that it's because I saw that, no, this, this is the singularity. This is where uh, all of the uh, interlocking systems of patriarchy and then uh, the racialization of, uh, of, of Europe, the beginning of the age of, uh, of exploration, so-called uh, the age of imperialism, the Columbian age, the age of slavery, the age of um, racial marking of um, uh, Jews and um, Muslims, the age of uh, the ethnic cleansing of uh, European indigeneity um, and the uh, under the sign of the cross. Like all these things um, uh, are like advancing and accelerating ex um, traditions, I believe, of uh, within um, uh, uh, patriarchy and then the, uh, the industrial revolution, the rise of uh, industrial capitalism after the uh, beginnings of uh, uh, agricultural capitalism and um, uh, colonial capital accumulation through Western expansion into uh, all the other continents of the world where uh, people and desirable resources uh, were to be found. And in the midst of all this mess, I, I think we find ourselves really at a, a point where we have no choice as a species except to thread a needle wherein our um, will to solidarity encompasses the entire human species and the, the life community with it. Um, the, the way to make sure that there is a human species, a human family living into the 21st century. And that's a huge uh, iffy game, but one worth playing as far as I'm concerned, is by helping uh, ourselves as a human uh, family through the birth canal of selfishness and into the um, wide open, uh, truly human, fully human, mature human light of um, universal, uh, unilateral and unconditional solidarity. This is a, a, a thing that uh, each um, human body and the body of the world is capable of. To be human means to be able to draw the circle of self and kinship in any way that we want. And what uh, the moment is demanding is that we draw it um, in a way that takes care of everyone so that everyone will be free. And it has been, a, 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 I really appreciated the, the time I spent. It's where I met uh, Kazu in the James Lawson Institute and heard from uh, the prophet's mouth himself that uh, that he they saw their work as an evolutionary work that it was something about um, um, being in a crucible of um, human making where we would be come a new creature but he said also we never expected that task to be complete in our lifetimes and that took such a, a burden off my shoulders that uh, that it's not for us to succeed or win the struggle for human liberation, but to engage it in a um, wholehearted and whole-minded way, in a whole-bodied way, in a fully um, truth forth truth, force, power, and way. So uh, that kind of um, altruism, as much of it as we can muster, I don't know what the critical mass is. It certainly doesn't have to be 100% because we're broken uh, uh, 
uh, beautifully, tragically imperfect beings, each one of us. But, uh, but it will have to be a lot more. And I believe that, uh, uh, again, that the uh, coronavirus slowing us down so that we can think more, so that we can feel more, shutting down so many frivolous entertainments and distractions so that we can numb less and, um, and dissociate less from the horrors that we are embedded in, this um, death system, this domination system, which uh, will either die without us because we throw it off and uh, play a whole new game, or it will take us with it, with it. And I don't think there's any pessimism or any downerness in accepting that uh, the trajectory on which we found ourselves is a death trajectory, uh, a, a, a massive extinction uh, for uh, a big part of the life community, which uh, will almost certainly include most or all of us uh, due to our own, um, I would say simply immaturity and hubris. But I have absolute and relentless social hope. I do. Even when I have personal despair and grouchy, grumpy, low-key, bitter ego reactivities, when I think about our species and all that we've overcome in so many contexts, large and small, I feel that we're completely capable entirely capable of everything that we need to do in order to survive. Uh, and I believe that uh, to become um, departments, in fact, uh, what, what Buckminster Fuller said that we are, and I, that has stuck with me, that we are departments of God, that we uh, implement our uh, the agency of God locally, meaning wherever we are. So uh, in the matter of uh, human liberation, oh, I, I, I didn't say this uh, uh, at the outset, because I, but um, I don't remember if it was Chris or Kazu was asking me, well, what do you want to call it? And I'm like, I don't give a damn. Uh, it's, uh, it's so small and disciplinary. I have things, deep thoughts that I want to share. <laughs> I've been thinking about in the lab for about 45 years. And, uh, and I don't know if I could actually put it into a title. So I said, call it uh, racial capitalism. There is, there is none, the future of racial capitalism. There is none. But I was kind of being flippant because I was annoyed and aggravated by the, uh, the, 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 uh, the paradigm limitations of the question itself. I do believe that it is upon us to, to be completely out of control, completely too big for our britches, completely throwing off shackles of uh, personal and collective uh, domestication because, because this is not a drill. We are in um, early stage apocalypse. And, uh, all these uh, discourses about uh, opening up the economy and getting back to normal, or even something called a new normal. I think, ooh, tragic nostalgia, really? You think normal is coming back? For your sake, for the sake of your loved ones. I mean, this has to be this is a this is a time for um, and I you know and I'm all tearful and uh, uh, watery because I you might I've lost um, uh, capacity to separate my intellectual and political moral passions from my embodied feelings uh, uh, as I speak it uh, I feel it and I don't give a damn 
it's too late to care about uh, fame, fortune, and reputation. It's um, time to be as alive as we know how to be and then lean even more so beyond that with um, reckless uh, uh, faith because our, our, um, our fear, as uh, St. Audre Lorde um, uh, prophesies, will not protect us. We're not safe because we're uh, trying not to, uh, to rock a, a, a boat that is sinking. We, um, if we let fly the, um, possibility that is within us to, um, reinvent whole cloth entirely what it means to be human because indeed that is what it means to be human there are so many human forms of life and on a dime as we so imagine or as we in the clutch find necessary we can uh, transform up level and reinvent and it is time for us to uh, set aside um like uh the Biden option for the planet. Come on, people. <laughs> like holding patterns are uh, uh, careening headlong toward um, more of what we're, we've got. The current trajectory is still the sixth great extinction of which we will no doubt be a, uh, on, the, um, on the itinerary for uh, uh, for, uh, final departures, yeah. And perhaps um, we will not be uh, witnessed by uh, sentience and maybe there won't be enough uh, complex um, neural and uh, sentient sensitivity in the, uh, in the earth system to uh, tell the tale of our hubris and how, um, what potential we had, but how we just um, couldn't find our love and courage and imagination uh, quickly or recklessly enough. So um, as a body in the body of the world standing against uh, white supremacy, not because I'm white or because I'm black or because I'm brown or because um, red indigenous and um, yeah, by lineage, I'm all of those things. Uh, by story, I'm black. Um, but I don't fight white supremacy because I have, a, I have been assigned to the category of black with this brown body and all its complex embodied lineages. Um, I fight that in male supremacy because uh, uh, these are forms of wickedness that I don't uh, want in my world. I don't want or need a better reason than that. And I don't need um, a different identity than body in the body of the world. I get tired of changing my damn identity all the time. Okay, so it's a brown body with a black story, um, you know, with uh, a second and third gen generation uh, refugee from terrorism status as my father fled uh, Anniston, Alabama in 1944 and never went back died in Syracuse, New York in 1976, and my uh, great-grandfather with uh, 40 of his relatives uh, fled um, Locust Grove, Georgia uh, in, uh, between 1910 and 1915, and, and we never went back, except for the family reunions, hey, um, because uh, we were fleeing racial terrorism. Like uh, we're po we were political refugees, and half of uh, the so-called Black Americans in the uh, in the U.S. have uh, stories of uh, fleeing um, racialized violence and political terrorism. Now, uh, why is there no future for racial capitalism? Uh, because race and capitalism are like two sides of a Mobius strip, like the uh, the yi the, the yellow side and the white side of the Playtex living glove, they're not separate things. They have separate faces and they're not reducible to one another, but they're also not extricable from one another ever or at all. 
neoliberalism, uh, which is a kind of a colorblind capitalism, is freaking racist because it um, accepts that there are, are races. Uh, race, race is a process. Race is an ideology. Race is a pigment of the imagination. Race is a story whose primary, primary function is to fracture human solidarities in order to allow uh, dominance, uh, domination systems, specifically those related to capital accumulation, to proceed um, uh, with, with, without um, a major hindrance from the, uh, the, the, the various layers of uh, 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 working, value-producing peoples who are being exploited all over the world. And at this point, we find that nation states are becoming uh, less and less re relevant. And races as a, uh, a social control uh, device are becoming less and less relevant too, because the, our, 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 our whoring ourselves to capital as uh, wage workers and um, downpressed uh, laborers um, that are, are, in a sense, conscripted into these economic systems um it makes it seem like that's the only uh, way forward that's possible but one of the reasons i feel like i'm, I'm made for this moment and, and I, i'm ready to wrap and uh receive uh questions because i have I, I, I have strong opinions about a lot of particular things I, I didn't really talk about trauma or the relationship between trauma uh oppression empire and liberation i have a lot to say about that but i'll leave it to your specific questions to know where to go out uh, uh, further in depth. Um, but I wanted to wrap with something and forgot what it was. Any, can, can anybody help me? Um, I don't remember what I was talking about. In any case, um, yes. Um, it's the, the, the task and the invitation, the call to adventure is uh, liberation. And what do I mean by liberation? I mean the uh, elimination of the causes, the institutions, the ideas, um, the intergeneralization, uh, intergenerational socialization, the memes and the ideologies, the propagandas, um, the elimination of the causes and the undoing of the effects. And that means justice making, but it also means healing. Liberation is not possible through ideological um, or uh, distributive justice alone. This kind of um, um, facing down the oppressor, that's not going to do it. And we also need to heal. And finally, whether we like it or not, in order to finish the job, we have to liberate the oppressor. Uh, this is a, one of the basic um, and forgotten lost tenets of uh, feminism, real feminism, I want to say, intersectional feminism, radical feminism. It, it's not about the, the war between the sexes, but ending the war on, uh, on women's bodies. And, with the recovery of, uh, of uh, female sovereignties and, uh, and cease th ceasing this, uh, the various heinous practices of domesticating our children, um, we, can, uh, uh, we can reinvent the world. But liberation is the undoing of the, uh, uh, the effects and the elimination of the causes of every form of social oppression, but not just for our own sake, but so that the we, the human family, can become a viable and um, regenerative presence in the life community, rather than um, its um, most um, present and existential threat. Um, so I'm feeling like it's my job at this time in history. Oh, yeah. It's about. Uh, um, being a torchbearer for a new paradigm, just throwing off whatever we thought it meant to be human before now. And, um, and beginning to invent and lean into a world which, uh, of course, uh, we cannot see 
from where we are. We ha uh, that there is a uh, a dimension of stepping out on faith, which is not woo woo. It is because within the complexities and the immensity of these complexities that we find ourselves, although I believe that we have the resources to meet it, the the things that we need to do, the goals as well as the means to reach them will be emergent. We'll be discovering them on the fly and reclaiming ourselves, reclaiming our absolute sense of um, unconditional kinship with every member of the human family. This is it. Uh, if, uh, how do we know if we're messing up as um, allies for the human family and allies for the earth? It's if we feel that uh, we're anything but immediate family to any other uh, member of our species. Like that distant family or not related stories, those are really just uh, stories. Our existential reality is one of uh, uh, utter and utmost kinship. And for us to um, practice that in, uh, in thought, word, and deed is, I believe, the revolution. It's done uh, with and through love and nonviolence. It's done through uh, transforming and confronting um, the uh, would-be oppressor with, uh, and, the, and the forces of repression, the dynamics of repression with uh, uh, with dignity and truth and damn good organizing, better than we've uh, been able to muster so far. I think uh, that's another thing we're gonna learn how to, on the fly is how to become better uh, organizers and multiply our, our, our strength rapidly. And um, in, um, in the chaos, which I find oh so shiny because it's both interesting and difficult, um, we, um, we will find God. So I'll stop with that and invite um, reflections, uh, questions, uh, follow-ups, rebuttals. Um, yeah, make me wrong. I don't mind. So before we jump into our breakout rooms, I'm going to uh, to say a few words about East Point's commitment to the gift economy and how we're holding this um, with Victor for this presentation. I'm gonna share my screen again. This will just take a minute. It's, um, yeah, it's a key feature of the work that East Point does that we operate on a gift economics model, which means that we don't charge for any of our offerings. Um, but instead follow some really beautiful principles. Um, let me see if I can show this to you. There are seven principles to the gift economics approach that, that we follow. And I'm not going to go into great detail here, but basically we're trying to free ourselves from the capitalist patterning that we have um, by moving you know, from these things, profit, hierarchies, controlling, planning, privacy, over to these other ways of being in relationship with each other and with resources, purpose, networks, empowerment, experimentation, transparency. And um, this enables us to make our offerings available to a lot more people. And one of the important features of this is transparency. And this gives you a sense of our budget for last year and just highlights how much of the money that we needed to do our programming, our uh, trainings and workshops in prison settings in the Bay Area, but also within the community. Um, the programming that we shifted into uh, when the coronavirus uh, touched down uh, to offering things like this uh, series, Where Do We Go From Here, along with lots of other, um, yeah, really powerful uh, nonviolence trainings and uh, related trainings. You can see that we've served in the last year over a thousand people. Here's a, a slide that just offers a glimpse of some of the folks that have been through our workshops, as I said, both in um, the outside community, but also inside 
prisons and jails in the Bay. So today we wanna to just invite all of those who have uh, been listening to Victor uh, to consider whether or not you wanna offer a gift um, in support of the work both that Victor's doing and that we at East Point Peace Academy are doing. And when I spoke with Victor before, um, before this call, we just talked about our, our current needs uh, in our life and what we felt like would be uh, helpful to us in terms of sustaining the work that we're doing. And it was pretty clear to us that just an even split between East Point and Victor felt like a good fit for this presentation today. So just so you know, if you do offer a gift, um, we'll split that 50-50 uh, between East Point and Victor. If you do wanna make a gift, uh, you can go to our website, um, eastpointpeace.org um, backslash Victor Donate. And if you, yeah, please include that Victor Donate part so we know that this um, giving was specifically for this uh, in connection with this presentation. And I wanna just make a special call out to consider setting up a monthly donation. If you're thinking of giving, uh, you know, $50, you might consider giving $5 um, over the course of several months. This really helps us know that we have a consistent uh, form of income from month to month. So that's, that's way better on our end, but whatever works for you is what we want. And just really encourage you to ask yourself whether or not it would feel good to you to offer a gift today. And I'm just gonna go back to this great quote by Marshall Rosenberg. When giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. And I still can't figure out who I'd rather be, the kid or the duck. Okay, welcome back everybody. And hope that that was a good experience for you in your breakout rooms. And I'm really happy to uh, open up the Q&A portion of our time together. Um, it's not really, well, I guess it is a question. Um, my name is Dr. Babe Kauai Bogue. Um, I am Black and Indigenous. I'm from the Bay Area, from San Francisco. And this past week I did, I want to say first, thank you everyone for holding this in. Victor, it was a really great um, presentation. Um, this past week I did a tech-free silent retreat and I forgot to get groceries before it started. So I went the first day to get groceries at Whole Foods and I ran into two microaggressions that were pretty intense just getting groceries. And I think it really, it messed up like half of my retreat. Um, and it was from people who have pushed out a lot of my friends who used to work at Whole Foods who are African-American and, um, just being harassed by somebody. And I, I didn't know what to say, but eventually I just said, how long have you lived in the Bay? And this person said, two years. And I said, my family's been here a hundred years. Like, I need you to give me space. So the question that was posed before this in the long paragraph was about compassion to oppressors and to a system. And I'm wondering what advice you would have, Victor, for you know Black and Indigenous folks in a place where we don't have community. Like being in San Francisco, from San Francisco, we don't have community left. Um, and so, how do you have compassion? How do you maintain a sense of you know wholeness, right, when you don't have the people to support you? With that. That's right. Uh, Self-compassion is first. And um, creating um, islands of refuge within a, a, a sea of silencing and invisibilizing and uh, uh, relentless, clueless ethnic cleansing especially of the city, it is freaking horrifying. <laughs> and people are just so happy to be there and have no idea what they killed. 
like like it's it's like a it's like a Disney prop resort, uh, you know, Mission Land. <laughs> we got wine bars, so self compassion, and um, as individuals, and and we, and as I'm um, a strangely hybrid, super ghetto, race in the projects, evicted from the projects at age 16 because my mom ran an after hour joint from out of our apartment and lived just lived on my own ever since. So I, I've been on the underside of the underclass and stuff. Um, but I also have like a, a, a the this wholly deeply assimilated side and I think it's a responsibility of people like me who um, have developed some antitoxin to uh, whiteness in some way that a lot of uh, more pardon the expression um, but I, it's the best I can come up with right now more culturally whole people uh, are just wiped out by this shit um so um on one hand i would say um come to me send them to me we'll 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 create um a brain uh change uh resilience co-ops where we can do the work for ourselves because care for the soul has been privatized to priesthoods and imams and abbots and um, uh, yoga teachers and and the uh, licensed therapists and licensed doctors when every form of care needs to be reclaimed from the marketplace and returned to the commonwealth to the community so in that regard um, uh, come to come to my training send folks to my training that uh, we're dreaming um, uh, the <clears throat> my new uh, initiative, the um, uh, uh, he uh, Healing Justice Institute, which is really going to be uh, uh, trauma informed social justice education, or um, uh, um, or, uh, or social justice informed uh, uh, trauma life coaching, uh, using emotional freedom techniques and a bunch of other tools that I've learned along the way, body based, uh, popular education, safe things that people can learn quickly and share uh, with anybody. And, uh, and I want to give that training away in the hopes that others will uh, seize it with uh, passion and geek out with it, learn it to the depth that I can teach it to you. And, um, and then uh, we'll be able to face these exact kinds of challenges. Um, and, and, and microaggressions especially are the wounds, the scars, the lesions left by microaggressions are exceptionally vulnerable to a very um, brief engagement in relational trauma and social justice informed body-based um, uh, 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 brain change practice. Uh, EFT as a as a tool for releasing toxic stress and trauma, um, the the meridian tapping uh, technique, which is uh, like somatic experience, and is like um, neuro linguistic programming, is like uh, trauma releasing exercises. All of those modalities, also things that I'm I'm trained in, but EFT is by far the easiest to learn and most transferable and um, adaptable to a wide range of uh, clinical care and uh, educational situations. So I, I say we need to develop a whole new um, uh, approach to showing people up that is explicitly liberation-based. It's not using the metaphors of, um, of um, communication and compassion and all that stuff. It's really about uh, recovering resilience so that we can uh, keep leaning toward uh, uh, liberation in a world where, uh, yeah, people don't get to um, uh, <clears throat> to continue the the crypto um, the the alliance between the crypto confederacy and the union, which I believe uh, when uh, the Klan was reinvented in uh, um, 
uh, Birth of a Nation was launched as the uh, the, the first blockbuster uh, film and meme generator in popular uh, American culture that amounted to uh, a, a, a back channel alliance between uh, the United States of America and the fucking Confederacy. And it's still happening. That's why we have those monuments. That's why they're still here. That's why they were built in the first place. That's why we have uh, Confederate flags uh, not taken with the same degree of contempt that the Germans would take the Nazi flag. And, and that, that is exactly as it should be. We tolerate the Nazi flag, they wouldn't. White uh, Aryans would not. Too much decency and healthy shame. Uh, it was helpful, I, I, got, I kind of went off on a thing. But um, no, it's really a, a movement uh, challenge rather than, an, 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 than a personal or individual challenge, isn't it? We need to create deep cultures of collaborative care that are quickly reproducible and rolloutable. And I, and I think I, 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 I believe I have that on a lot. I don't have much executive function like I'm a spew machine, but um, I do have the knowledge um, and I can train um, as many people as are, are willing and able to learn how to, how, to, how, to, how to bring that to whatever communities they want to. Yeah, I just want to know, uh, Victor, what inspires you most in this work and in these thoughts that you, that you these revelations? And ancestors, ancestors, and um, and belief that this is uh, this is birthing time. This is the most exciting time ever. I really do think that w to be a part of the generation um, in which we witness the maturation of our species, or maybe we're just one generation removed from actually growing up and recognizing ourselves as a singular species with the capacity to be uh, in absolute solidarity one to another, even in celebration and coexistence with dramatic uh, differences uh, between uh, uh, communities, nations, tribes. I mean, nations will become transparent and uh, ephemeral, well, they already are really imaginary communities, but the, um, the different forms of life that we would call different cultures, uh, different um, uh, flavors of uh, and, uh, and fractals of uh, indigeneity and, and, and also the so-called, um, um, you know, the, the massification cultures or, or, was, uh, or classical cultures who, who live in giant uh, hives. So what, what inspires me is the, is the belief that uh, we have what it takes now to assure the long range uh, viability and generativity of our species. Uh, I think the, 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 the conditions are ripe for uh, a, a global solidarity grab where we just reach across the world to every other uh, uh, person who is extracted uh, head from anus and, uh, and saying, no, we, we, we got to bring the love, we got to bring it strong, we got to bring it hard, we got to bring it now. And um, it could be enough. And, uh, and, and even if it's, uh, uh, you know, one in a thousand uh, thread the needle um, uh, uh, possibilities, those are damn good odds for such a beautiful world. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful transdisciplinary synthesis with us. And I, you answered some of my questions as far as some of your vision um, moving forward. And um, I also, I guess, it occurs to me to want to ask maybe a question in terms of if you were to think of um, the top three things that you want to call in for the greatest co-conspiratorial synergistic alchemical uh, impact on expanding your vision, what might they include? Mm, I'm going to uh, pretend like I understood your question and answer it accordingly. I believe that, uh, the, that um, what we're left with now, we have all the knowledge we need, but we have a serious software problem. Um, the uh, the uh, the fact that it isn't common knowledge how to settle down the uh, limbic system 
to settle down our fight, flight, um, uh, freeze uh, responses in favor of courageous and imaginative um, self-respecting uh, social engagement under almost all conditions, that is something that, that, that needs to change. So I'm, I, I think we need a cadre of, um, of, um, uh, of monk bodhisattvas that are really about mastering um, reactivity, not through rhetoric, but through um, positive, self-directed, science-based um, or uh, in, in indigenous practice-based um, um, self-directed neuroplasticity. That, that, that's wisdom and power. And, um, and once we get that software uh, problem sorted so that we can be non-reactive in situations where reactivity is almost universally demanded by default, then we win. It makes me want to tell a, a, a one minute story about the, uh, you have to look it up, but there was, uh, during the Bay of uh, uh, Pigs crisis, there was a, uh, a diesel, um, uh, fresh water, uh, nuclear submarine in, uh, in the Caribbean that was ready to launch because they were being flushed out and a submarine captain's duty is to, uh, to launch um, missiles uh, rather and go down fighting rather than be forced to surface by the enemy. And there was an, uh, a Soviet admiral on that submarine who convinced the captain not to launch and instead, but not to surrender either, but instead to just surface and see what they want, to see what the Americans want. And that fucking comment that intervention is what prevented a nuclear war during the Bay of Pigs, and that requires um, uh, neuro flexibility under uh, and the capacity to be in social engagement when everything screams going to fight, fly, to freeze. And that's the revolutionary um, uh, truth for us, um, uh, brain power. And I think uh, whatever else we do, we've got to get that um, on a on like a um, uh, like a Manhattan Project level. Thanks for the question, Joy, and your response, Victor. I'm going to run another question by you. This is from Nirali. Dear friend Victor, what is I'm the Nirali. role? She asks, what is the role of the sacred in these times? Uh, the role of the sacred is, um, for me, is that I'm not attached to the outcome. I actually feel like I'm engaged in idle pursuit, although I've been working seven days a week for the last few months, more or less. Um, 60 to 70 hours, I awake, I sleep, I work, I uh, respond to the uh, opportunities and difficult challenges that are so shiny of the moment. Um, and, uh, and I don't really care. Uh, you know, I, I think I wanted to say uh, what made me think I was um, made for this moment is that I spent the last couple of years in what seemed like a state of depression, uh, which sort of stripped me of any attachment to fame and fortune. Uh, in fact, I, I came to a place where I was just like, screw it, I, can, I don't have the energy to pursue fame and fortune anyway, and I don't believe in that shit regardless, so why am I tripping? <laughs> I just give it up. I don't care about fame and fortune. And I don't even care about being successful. I don't care if I accomplish a goddamn thing as far as I, uh, for as long as I live, uh, as long as I can suck oxygen, uh, uh, spread love in my immediate environment and do what um, my calling says do. Uh, I, it's not for me to, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to cross no finish line. I'm in it to stay in it. I think uh, revolution and liberation is really the infinite game. Uh, life is the infinite game, keeping life going and um, becoming more uh, beautiful, complex, and viable rather than uh, screeching to some jacked up halt. So that's, uh, that, that's how I think about it. I really want to um, uh, allow myself to be an instrument of the sacred, and I feel that I am. I feel that God made me to um, be in a state of relentless social hope and high-toned um, 
resourcefulness uh, when almost everybody I know is feeling more compromised. I feel stronger, happier, and more alive than I have in over a decade. And I believe it's because um, God made me for this moment. And I don't even know what God is, except uh, not an extrinsic thing, not anything that uh, atheists can uh, uh, set up and knock down. Uh, it's like I, I, I'm, I'm not a, a, a straw, straw man theist. Like uh, I love um, all of the critiques of uh, atheists, and I agree absolutely. Except that I don't know how intelligence could get into the world if it wasn't in the world already. I don't know how love could get into the world if it wasn't in all in the world already. How consciousness could get into the world um, from non-existence somewhere and then poof, show up uh, in the world. So how does life and consciousness and um, the universe story, which is a developmental reality going in a singular direction, it's not looping in circles, how does that even happen? Because God, that's how. And what is God? God is uh, uh, what uh, gives you the uh, imagination to ask that question. And it's also you, your department of it. Amen. Thank you, Nirali, for that question. <laughs> Shakti, you're laughing. Say something, Shakti. <laughs> Is there a follow-up, Shakti? I feel you. <laughs> God is why I do what I do, and I don't give a damn. I don't. I'm just, I'm just in it to stay in it. And, and when it's time to uh, stop moving about the earth, doing me, I'll, I'll compost. See what comes next. Maybe that's it. I don't care. <laughs> that's the role of the sacred. Uh, make uh, make it beautiful uh, while you got it. The coming of the sun, man, it's going to be like a thief in the night, meaning don't miss your moment. Um, you gotta get your affairs in order. Do it today. Today or tonight. Love the, Shower the ones you love with love and all that corny shit. That's real. We're about to shower you with some love, Victor. Um, what I'd like to do is just make a couple of announcements about upcoming things that East Point is offering, and then turn it back to you for maybe two minutes of just sort of closing remarks, anything that you want to share before we bid farewell to, to one another. Sound good? Thanks everybody for your questions. I, I want to just bring to your attention, there, there have been some uh, helpful comments in the chat, including uh, a link to uh, Victor's website, uh, there's a question from another participant um, who's seeking some uh, guidance on trainings and curriculum that you can all just add some uh, responses to if you feel so moved. Just want to let you know that the next speaker scheduled in our Where Do We Go From Here series is Leonie Smith, a wonderful uh, educator. She's a black woman of Jamaican descent currently living in uh, Vancouver, uh, Canada really close friend of East Points, and she will be uh, talking on the topic, nonviolent communication for the rest of us. And that'll be on September 15th uh, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific. And I also wanna let you know that we have a Kingian nonviolence mini workshop uh, coming up on November 14th at 9 a.m. Kazu, are you facilitating that? Yep, Kazu's a fantastic uh, Kenyan nonviolence trainer. Um, so put that in your calendar, 9 a.m. on November 14th, a mini workshop in Kenyan nonviolence. That's nonviolence um, extrapolated from the, the theory and practice of Dr. Martin Luther King. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna hand it back to Victor for any closing remarks and then uh, we'll kind of open up everyone's uh, microphone so we can say thank you to Victor and goodbye to one another. Well, I would like to invite you to uh, hit me up on Facebook and uh, check in about 
my um, uh, courses at uh, hardconversations.com. I have two. One is called Introduction to Racism, which is sort of like a graduate school level course on uh, institutional and structural racism um, <clears throat> that is uh, um, curated in a, in a virtual format. We've got uh, seven hours of live calls and um, a buttload of uh, really awesome um, interviews and uh, videos and texts and materials of all sorts. Another course is called Whiteness, Race, and Social Justice, also on the Hard Conversations brand. Love for you to check that one out because I have learned more in the last six months about race and identity and uh, human liberation through studying whiteness through three films, The Color of Fear, Birth of a Nation, which is and uh, Get Out. Uh, so we're using those three films as major texts, cl doing close readings of all three. I believe that Birth of a Nation and Get Out are like the absolute polar opposite of each other, that Get Out is the first adequate clap back to the Birth of a Nation in the history of cinema. It is one of the most brilliant films of all time. I'd say top 10, no doubt. And, uh, and a, a straight up sleeper, even if you've seen it. Um, so yeah, check us out at uh, hardconversations.com. And if you're interested in uh, the, the Radical Resilience EFT training, um, which may be hosted and co-curated um, by uh, East Point because uh, we share ethics. Uh, when, I, when I work by myself and going forward, I just wanna do every single thing on the gift basis and it is a gift for me if I can teach you what I know if you will receive it or anybody I will I, I will give you everything and, and I hope you uh, will receive it and, and help me um, um, make it happen in any way that you can thanks again Victor for being with us yeah much love to you and and strength with with the good work that you're bringing to our community Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.